I've got family pictures this Thanksgiving, or else I'd just shave to a mustache. Hey internet, I'm Steve the Cosmere Knot, and this is Raffo. <laughs> book 4 in the Skyward series is coming TONIGHT! It says book 4, but in reality it's book, like, 8? A lot of things happen in this increasingly ill-named quadrilogy, so let's get you caught up. Meet Spensa. She's just a normal girl living on a boring planet. If by normal we mean overdramatic and bloodthirsty, and by boring we mean a wasteland where humanity has to live underground for fear of annihilation by the alien force stationed outside the massive orbiting platform surrounding their planet. There have been three, count them, three galactic scale wars. Basically humans versus everybody else. And Spence's people are descended from the crew of the Defiant, a fleet that tried to escape involvement in the last human war. But were targeted by the Krell anyway and crash landed on Detritus 80 years ago. The populations of various ships fled and lived separately in caverns beneath the surface, with much of their knowledge and technology lost. But once they started to build starfighters again, they consolidated much of that population and built a surface base, fighting back against their containment. Spence's father was a pilot in one of these starfighters, and since his publicized cowardice and subsequent death, she's fought to clear her father's name and become a pilot herself. Politics happen, and she barely makes it into flight school. And here we meet the rest of Skyward Flight. Roll call! Cobb is the grumpy instructor and Spence's father's old wingmate. Jorgen Waite, called Jerkface, is the over-serious rich kid flight leader. Raj McCaffrey, who Spencer calls Rig, moves on to engineering after their first battle. Then there's Kimmelin, call sign Quirk, bless her stars. Freya, call sign FM, who doesn't think much of the DDF's militaristic culture. Arturo, call sign Amphi, and Ned, call sign Netter, it's longer than... are basically the crab and goyle to Jerkface's Malfoy, but with actual personalities. We also have Bim, Hurl, and Morningtide, R.I.P. Because of Spence's dad's cowardice, she's been barred from using basically any of the base facilities. Good thing she just found a fancy busted up starfighter in a cavern that she can sleep in. Rig helps her fix it up, along with Doomslug the Destroyer, a yellow and blue slug that seems to be able to move very fast when you're not looking. After stealing a power matrix from Jerkface's car, she plugs it in and her ship turns on, introducing itself as Mbot, an AI-driven long-range stealth fighter that crash-landed with its pilot 172 years ago, which would predate the Defiant crash on the planet by 90 years. Commander Spears, Mbot's old pilot, gave him the final command to lie low, take stock, and don't get into any fights. Take stock apparently means categorize mushrooms? Spencer continues to fix up slash live in Mbot while she progresses through flight school. Ironsides, the leader of the DDF, confirms that she has some sort of defect, the same her father had. Her piloting skills get better and better. Light lances are just so cool. And we get some really awesome dogfighting sequences, chasing through the hulls of a falling orbital shipyard for one. More flight members leave or die, Spencer salvages the booster from Hurl's wreck to attach to Mbot. She finally manages to see a recording of the Battle of Alta, the flight where her father supposedly turned tail and ran. But it's worse than that. The recording shows him breaching the debris field around the planet, then turning and shooting down his own flight mates, before Mongrel, Cobb, takes him out. Cobb doesn't believe in the defect, but he asks Spencer if she's seen the eyes or hear the stars. Rig gets Mbot fully repaired, minus destructors and uh, whatever a cytonic hyperdrive is. Spin takes him on a test flight through a holographic battle of Alta. She tries to keep up with the recording of her father, but he's anticipating the Krell's ship's maneuvers somehow. Convinced Spencer will try and take him into battle, Mbot powers down to follow his original pilot's last orders. Grand Grand tells her the story of the crew of the Defiant, and the mutiny that led them to Detritus. Detritus. While on a simple scouting mission, which turned into a Krell attack, Spensa gets shot down and ejects before she crashes. That gives Ironsize the excuse she needed to kick her out of flight school. Jorgen and FM are the only members of the flight that actually graduate. We find out that a big old chunk of orbital platform with hundreds of acclivity rings, the shiny rock that ignores gravity and makes planes fly, is gonna fall, and the DDF wants it. Trouble is, the 
but Krell definitely don't want them to have it, so they launch a massive attack. Spensa doesn't have a ship anymore, but there's a spare Poco that was being repaired that she jumps in. Destructors and Light Lance, but no shields, and the acclivity ring is spotty. Trying to take out the Life Buster bomb, she realizes she can somehow hear the commands being sent to the enemy ships. The bomb is getting close to Alta, and she decides to ram it. Just then, her acclivity ring gives out and she drops out of the sky. Trapped in her ship, with Krell fighters closing in, is this the end for our brave little bloodthirsty pilot? Nope! Cobb shows up, flying Mbot, who rewrote part of his code when he wasn't looking, changing his registered pilot to Spensa. In hop spin, chasing after that life buster. Quirk snipes the clamps on the bomb, and Spensa snags it with a light lance, towing it away from Alta before it can blow up. Suddenly, Mbot announces the biological component to the Cytonic hyperdrive is online, and they VoIP away right as the life buster goes off, jumping a hundred kilometers away instantaneously. Rather than coming back to base, Spensa sees a break in the debris field and hears the stars. Off she goes to find what her father saw. She finally comes face to face with the Krell, who turn out to be little crab guys in robot suits, and she terrifies them. Mbot manages to download some information on them after blocking their cytonic attack on Spensa. Turns out they're basically wardens of a planet-sized prison for humanity after their last unsuccessful galactic conquest, and Spensa just proved how defiant they still are. Book one, check. Book two, Go! A few months after the end of Skyward, humanity has taken control of the orbital platforms around Detritus. Well, one orbital platform. The rest of them are still doing a bang-up job at shooting anyone who comes near. Like, anyone. Engineers are working on gaining control of those, but in the meantime, they just found an ancient video from the Second Human War! Turns out those eyes Spencer saw in the Nowhere once came out of the Nowhere and ate everybody. And they were also... Spensa? Raj has been working on Mbot systems, particularly his holographic projectors. He and Cobb have a plan for Spensa to infiltrate the superiority and steal their hyperdrive technology, so humanity can escape Detritus before they get bombarded. Oh look! An opportunity to do just that! Enter Alanik of the Erdale a purple-skinned alien conveniently roughly Spence's same height and build, who, before passing out from blood loss, implants the coordinates of Starsight, a superiority space platform, into her mind. Jorgen gives her the go-ahead, and then they kiss. Bloop! Spence is 40 light years away. Infiltrating superiority flight school was uh, surprisingly easy. Spence is now posing as Alanique thanks to Mbot's mobile hologram projector bracelet. The Erdial, from a planet called Redon, allied with the humans during the last human war, and therefore are considered third-class citizens of the superiority. If she does well, maybe her people will get a bump up! She's got a handler named Kuna, who is a species of alien called Dion, and is a member of the Department of Species Integration, hence their special interest in Alanique. The superiority is collecting pilots for involvement in a Delver prevention type program. The Delvers are the eyes Spensa sees in the nowhere, the things that ate all the people in that old video. This program is also overseen by a Varvax named Winzik. Spensa knows them as the Krell, but that's just an acronym for Space Cops for Humans, who brings along Braid, another human who is effectively his pet. Mbot scrubs their quarters of surveillance thingies, and Spensa gets Doomslug comfortable. Wonder how she got here? Tryouts begin, and the superiority drones the auditioners are fighting against are using live fire, which appropriately pisses off a bunch of people. After teaming up with a crew of Kitson, basically fox gerbil samurai, led by their definitely not a king Hesho, an unborn Dion named Moriumer, a draft, basically a test run of a personality with half of them formed from each parent, and Vapor, basically a sentient scent cloud that can take over electronics. Spence is about to go tell off Winzik for killing civilians, but she gets beaten to the punch, unfortunately not literally, by a big old gorilla looking alien guy. More on him later. They all get put into a flight together with Braid, Winzik's pet Cytonic, officially dubbed Flowers of Night's Last Kiss. Gathering on a larger troop transport ship, Spensa hears a scream as they pass through the nowhere to get to the Delver training maze. After drilling some much-needed fundamentals, Vapor and Spensa check out the inside of the maze. Spensa recognizes writing on the walls from tunnels on Detritus. Detritus! Potentially signs of a nowhere portal. 
They all practice with simulated hallucinations. You gotta have two people in the Delver maze so you can compare what it's sending. She and Mbot make a spy drone to peek on the cytonic hyperdrive of the ship, and Mbot tells her more info on humanity he's gleaned from the superiority internet. Humanity's first contact with aliens was by an old telecommunications company. Also, Doomslug is a Tanix, and is apparently venomous. We then get to one of my favorite chapters in all of fiction, let alone Sanderson. Starsight Chapter 28 where Spencer realizes that the people on the other side of this war are just that. People. The people you disagree with, the people on both sides of any conflict, big or small, are fundamentally just people. Different races, different ideologies, actual different species, but still all the same. War is hell and we shouldn't be doing it. Mbot's been watching the news, and the superiority claims that humanity has nearly escaped its nature preserve on Detritus. I mean, they ain't wrong. The current debate is whether or not they should simply be exterminated. Pretty aggressive from a society that values peace and conformity above all else. Back on Detritus, Jorgen is hanging out with Grand Grand, because he's been feeling some cytonic urges. Not from the stars, but from within the planet. Braid and Spensa make it to the center of the Delver maze. Maybe actually a dead Delver? And Braid tests the superiority's super weapon. Basically just a cytonic neon sign pointing at Detritus. Guess who knows the way home now? Operation Sneak a Peek at a Hyperdrive is a go! It, uh, goes poorly. Spy Drone triggers an alarm and starts popping off shots with a pistol. Spencer manages to snag it without being noticed, but then Vapor takes her to a shuttle with Kuna, where they reveal their suspicion that she's really an Erdale spy trying to steal hyperdrive secrets. Close. So close. They watch the footage from her spy drone, and she sees that the hyperdrives are really Tanix slugs, the same variety as Doomslug. Makes sense why old Commander Spears told Mbot to look for mushrooms. Doomslug thinks they're yummy. The superiority has been losing its stranglehold on hyperdrive technology, so Kuna and Winzik developed the Delver Resistance Program. Winzik to control the universe through fear, and Kuna to prove that the aggression of lesser species has value. They show Spensa that original gorilla alien getting sucked through a nowhere portal. Spensa turns off her hologram. This is the opportunity Kuna wanted, albeit in an unconventional way. Their team-up is interrupted, however, when Vapor comes back to get Spensa. A Delver has been spotted. Vapor already knew that she's human, so when an announcement by Winzik says they're off to destroy the human fleet on Detritus, Spensa considers this a great opportunity to also recruit Braid. Nope! She's got a dip, and jumps back to Detritus, leaving Mbot to continue trying to rewrite his programming. Back to her home planet, she warns the DDF that company is coming. She reports to Cobb, but then hears Braid trying to summon a Delver. Back in her fighter, she finds the Kitson ship and offers Hesho the first shot at a human. His crew overrules him. Yay, actual democracy! And they team up again. Vapor joins the party, but Moriamer is gone, having decided to undraft. Spensa tells the DDF to shut off all communications in preparation for the Delver, and they go after Braid. She finally realizes the value of flight mates, and Vapor manages to take control of Braid's ship, but not before a Delver actually appears. Detritus is silent, though, and Starsight is making lots of noise. It turns out that trying to harness eldritch horrors that can consume entire planets can, predictably, backfire. Spensa hears Grand Grand urging her to prove the superiority wrong about humans, so she links up with Vapor and the Kitson, minus Hesho, who probably got sucked into space right before the Delver showed up, and voips back. Moriamer is literally just about to split apart when the Delver shows up. You still got a job to do, buddy! Trying to beat Braid to the Delver's heart isn't going well, as Spensa lost Vapor along the way. Then comes one of my favorite Sanderson twists. Since Moriamer is technically two people, the Delver visions don't really work. Different visions to the different halves of their brain make it real easy to see through them. They snag Spensa with a light lance and put her through to the heart. Spensa confronts the Delver. After experiencing the Delver's perspective, the annoyance and meaninglessness of those little lights when you're the size of a galaxy, mosquitoes, swarms of mosquitoes, she's able to project hers. 
shrinking to the size of a child, seeing the world and the people around you with wonder, with kindness, with joy. That chapter. Those lights the Delver was stamping out are alive. In horror, it reverses in on itself, leaving Spensa floating in space. Epilogue. Jorgen, Ned, and Arturo are deep in the caves on Detritus, following a sound that only Jorgen can hear. He dives through an underwater tunnel and finds hundreds of Tainix. Secret chapter after the epilogue. Spencer wakes up in a superiority hospital with Kuna, who tells her their department's first contact with the DDF went well. Oh, cool. Yes, it is cool. No, Coup! Winzik's trying to take control of the superiority, so they gotta get out of here. Spencer gives Kuna her holographic bracelet, then makes it outside to see Braid take down a military ship with a rocket launcher. Not sticking around for that, she runs to the building where the gorilla alien got exiled, looking for Mbot. She finds him, but his hull has been ripped apart and his processor smashed. They really don't like AI. The little spy drone from before flies up. Mbot managed to reprogram himself into the drone, one line of code at a time between forced restarts. No cytonic processors, but he's alive. Doomslug was hiding in Mbot's ship, so Spencer snags them both and dives headfirst into the nowhere. And on that cliffhanger, we had to wait two full years to find out what happened. We did get the Skyward Flight novellas during that time, though, but I'll go over those in a different video, just in case you haven't read them. It'll be linked at the end of this. Cytonic. Picking up right where we left off, Spensa, Embot, and Doomslug jump into the nowhere. She chats with the Delver she repelled, who tells her to walk the Path of Elders, and then she tells Doomslug to go home. Bloop! She's in a jungle! I don't know how bloop became the hyperjump noise, but here we are. Embot's still here, but he's mad. No Doomslug, but she's got her dad's old pilot pin. Weird. She gets snatched by some aliens, but then some dude rides in on a dinosaur and frees her. His name's Chet Starfinder, fellow Cytonic and gentleman adventurer. Unfortunately, the dinosaur, a Grig, eyes on its shoulders, feeds on energy, gets possessed by a Delver and chases them off the side of their tiny floaty island. Chet conveniently knows a lot about the Nowhere and the Path of Elders. He's been here for around 170 years, placing him entering the Nowhere about the same time Mbot crashed on Detritus. Goodness golly gracious, it's Commander Spears! Nap time. Spensa talks with Jorgen flying a Poco with a bunch of cuts on his face. Spoilers for Sunreach. She then hears Braid and Winzik bargaining with the Delvers, wanting to use them to destroy enemy Cytonics. They say okay, rut -row. Continuing to cross a wide variety of landscaped islands, there's lots of conversation about old human stories. Dune, Paradise Lost, the Delvers, Detritus, Detrit... No, I said it right. And they eventually make it to the first portal. It was made by the somewhere leaking into the nowhere, just like Cytonics are created by the nowhere radiating back. These portals contain memories of old Cytonics. Discussion gets interrupted by another island smashing into theirs. Chet's never seen a collision so violent before. They decide to try and steal a starfighter from a nearby pirate base, crossing an ocean segment on the way. Nap time again. Spensa finds Jorgen just post-shower. It's been five days since their last contact. Braid then attacks Spensa, but she manages to fight back. They make it to the pirate base. Chet suggests she bury her pin, a reality icon, which helps her keep her memory and personality intact in the nowhere so the pirates don't find it. Sus. So she fakes it. He doesn't go for it once she leaves, so she buries it somewhere else and goes into the dark hangar. Unfortunately, not all aliens give off heat signatures, and she tries to steal an occupied ship. There's a big old crystal growing in the cockpit. And now she's their cleaning slave. But she can still chat chat cytonically. He got shot, and also feels bad that Spencer thought he'd betray her, and also isn't sure who he is. Guy's got it rough. She finally gets taken off leash and is able to have Mbot help her clean some Starfighter stuff. It's been two weeks with the pirates. Time gets weird when you're... nowhere. She bonds with the other members of the pirate flight. Maxim, another human who was basically a pet like Braid. Naluba, a Varvax who was essentially an accountant. Shiver, the crystal in the ship called a Resonant. And Peg, a Tanasi who used to be a superiority officer of a mining facility in the nowhere. She manages to beat Peg in single combat bad knees will always get you, and steals a ship that Mbot uploaded himself into. Her dad's pin is gone, so she picks up Chet and tries to fly straight up. 
Peg radios her warning about losing yourself by going too high and offering her best ship if Spencer will beat the pirate champion. <laughs> it's so it's cool. Spencer starts to train the other pirates how to fly better, and they make it to the next stop on the Path of Elders. This island is covered in ruins with human markings. The memories contained therein show contact between humans and the Erdile. Erdale. Eventually, a woman who seems to be able to hear Spencer's questions, the only survivor of a huge united battle against a Delver-like beastie, tells her to seek out the memories of Jason Wright, who Mbot recognizes as the name of the first human to contact the wider galaxy. The next portal is in Surehold, in the Superiority's main base. To get there, Spencer agrees to attack the base with the rest of the pirates. Unfortunately, their base is already being attacked by other pirates. She does real well. Non-lethal dogfighting is less stressful. And the opposing pirate leader, Peg's son, Graham, agrees to a formal duel. Sleepy time again, Spencer fights Braid, with Jorgen eventually joining her. They make a lot of noise, and the Delvers agree to Winzik's plan. It's time to... Duel! Except it's not against Graham anymore, it's versus Dark Shadow. The nameless warrior without a past, cursed to wander eternity without Homer... Oh, it's totally Hesho. Super pirate team up, almost, activate! Spencer tells them the story of the Lion King, but then they get another platform thrown at them, which they manage to divert. Next day, after checking in with Jorgen, they assault Surehold. She feels her father's pin, upset that she buried it. The holdout pirate faction has sided with the superiority. That, plus a delver in the somewhere throwing a city at them, makes the attack real tricky. Hesho gets possessed by a Delver, which admits they're scared of her and are willing to make a truce if she doesn't go past Surehold. For freeing him from the Delver's control, Hesho vows to be Spencer's bodyguard. They claim the superiority base. Chet offers to explore the nowhere with Spencer, and Peg says she's welcome to stay with the pirates. It's a lot to think about, so she takes a nap. She can hear Jorgen, but something is blocking her from contacting him. She wakes up, still in turmoil, and searches for her father's pin. Turns out it was Doomslug all along! You are my home! Here's some poop. Only the yellow-blue Tainix turn into items in the nowhere, but Doomslug says there's tons of varieties. Peg shows her her bonded tree and gives her a fruit to plant. It's a great honor. Spencer decides to continue toward the light burst. She and Chet go to the portal on Surehold, and they see a memory of Jason Wright entering the Nowhere with a floating silver sphere, an AI. Spencer realizes the Delvers were originally AI, and that Chet is the Delver she influenced at the end of the last book. She senses that the Delvers are going to chuck a bunch of platforms at the base, so the team takes off for the final portal, which contains the memories of the original Delver, the AI Jason patterned after his dead wife, Lana. Contact with the Nowhere allowed that AI to grow self-aware, and when Jason eventually died, it deleted its memories and personality in order to remove the pain of that loss. It rewrote its code and copied itself thousands upon thousands of times. Now each of those near-infinite copies is trying to prevent them from escaping. Two plans fail, and Chet chooses to sacrifice himself, transforming back into a Delver to provide an opening for Spencer. So that's how they do it. He gets consumed and locked away again. Doomslug's got one final plan, land. She's able to hide them, making the ship look like a big rock. Mbot apparently spots two more Tainix outside the ship, encouraging Spencer to get out and grab them. Made you look. Spencer promises to come back for him, and he blasts as far away from them as he can, eventually exploding in a flash of light and smoke. Spencer, Doomslug, and Hesho walk their way to the light burst. And the Delvers are mad. They attack her in this place without a place. All but one. She grabs hold of that Delver that was Chet and joins with it, welcoming it in, giving it the capacity to change and grow, which capacity the other Delvers fear. He saw Mbot explode, but did not see Mbot die. They step out of the nowhere onto Detritus. She voips up to Platform Prime and swoons into Jorgen's arms. He's in command now, apparently, and Detritus is orbiting another planet. How did this happen? You gotta read and find out. Or just watch my next video.
Thanks all. If you're at Dragonsteel Con, come say hi to me at my booth. Doug, Matt, Steve, Data Gremlin, Alec, Craig, Scotty, thank you particularly for your support. If you want a recap of the Skyward Flight novellas and Defending Elysium, click here so you can watch and find out.